Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Knowledge is Great lecture, Balance is New Normal. My name is Lissy. I'm the head of education in British Council Singapore. Um, so a quick run over the program. Um, I will um, first introduce and invite uh, Ms. Kara Owen, who's the British High Commissioner in Singapore, to uh, welcome and open up this uh, Knowledge is Great lecture. Um, following that, uh, Dr. Sarah Mesh, who is our Director of Arts for British Council Singapore, will introduce our speaker of today, Professor Jason Pomeroy. Uh, Professor Pomeroy will then deliver his lecture. Uh, once uh, Jason is done, we'll wow. open up the Q&A. You will be able to post your questions in the chat box. And uh, depending on the time, Jason will then be able to address as many of these as possible. Uh, once we are done, I will invite um, Miss Lucy Watkins, the country director of British Council Singapore, to uh, say a few words in closing the lecture. Um, could I also just uh, say that if you wanted to stay on um, and probably um, have a few more uh, discussions with Professor Pomeroy. We'll keep the, the call open for another 10, 15 minutes afterwards. Uh, do note that the, rec uh, the lecture is being recorded for the benefit of those who couldn't make it today. Um, and there is also a, a Singapore Sign Language Interpretation, which Azam will be providing throughout the session. So without wasting much time, without further ado, let's begin. Um, again, uh, a quick reminder to please um, mute your microphones and switch off your videos uh, until you're ready to speak. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, preserve bandwidth that way. Um, to, to begin, let me please uh, invite Ms. Kara Owen, British High Commissioner Singapore, to please um, open our Knowledge is Great lecture for today. Lucy, uh, thank you so much and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words about the series itself um, and also about what, um, give a little taster of the kind of things that we're going to be hearing about uh, during Professor Jason Pomeroy's uh, lecture. Um, so the Knowledge is Great lecture series was launched in 2015 by the British Council here in Singapore. And for us, the UK and Singapore, it's one of our kind of flagship ways that we are able to share UK knowledge, creativity and innovation with our friends and colleagues uh, here in Singapore. Um, throughout the series, we have invited leading UK specialists uh, to speak to peers, to academics, to practitioners, to students, to the general public on areas of topical debate and to be prepared to launch into a bit of a discussion with that audience. The first session five years ago uh, featured Professor Peter Abrahams from Warwick Medical School and he talked to us about Leonardo da Vinci and how the 15th century um, anatomist artistic and conceptual ideas anticipated the 21st century radiology. I really wish I'd been there for that because I feel like it would have blown my mind. Um, since then, the British Council has collaborated with many, many institutions and organisations, both in UK and Singapore. Uh, to bring uh, to audiences lectures which are engaging and uh, relevant. Um, and if I know Jason, as I think I do, uh, what is going to delight us in the uh, next period will be absolutely both of those. I'm totally confident that what he says is going to be engaging and highly relevant. Um, some of the other topics that we've covered uh, have uh, been things like truth and social media. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, climate change, and ensuring high quality healthcare through education. So you can see the topics are really varied, uh, but when I'm reading through them there, they feel very um, pertinent to the questions that policymakers uh, and citizens have uh, on their minds now. Um, this year, the series is going to explore key growth sectors and future jobs. So I don't know how you feel, but having lived through COVID, um, it really feels like things that we thought, transformations that we thought were going to take years have happened kind of overnight in weeks. Uh, people have had to be really agile, have had to be really innovative, and it feels like we're at an opportunity in a moment where we can really rethink uh, the world uh, that we're living in. 
Um, so uh, it's really fitting, I think, that the first lecture in 2020 is about the built environment, the way we plan and build our cities, construct and design infrastructure and allocate space and resources has really wide ranging impacts um, on our economies, on our jobs, on our quality of life, on our health, uh, on our societies, on climate change and sustainability. The way we think about our own built environment is changing, though, um, including uh, um, in the light of COVID. I bet uh, we are not the only organisation to be thinking about how exactly we're going to use this space that we own um, in this world uh, where the way we work has significantly changed. And that applies also to where we live and to where we choose to play. Um, so in today's lecture, Balance is the New Normal, Professor Jason Pomeroy will speak about some of the current challenges faced by our urban habitats and the global need for future sustainable built environment thinking. So normally we do this in person and I would be delighted to host this uh, at my wonderful residence Eden Hall or in another partner organisation. Um, but obviously we are working, we can't do that anymore, we're working in virtual mode. Uh, I think that has the benefit of uh, opening up a greater number of people who could be part of the lecture series, both as speakers, but also as uh, audience. And we're really pleased that we've got colleagues uh, from the UK joining the session today. Um, Jason, this has now gone virtual and I can think of no one better to ensure that we are totally engaged through our screens. Uh, you're really engaging in real life, you're really engaging on the screen, so I can't wait uh, to hear what you've got to say. So I'm going to pass back, I think, to Lissy or Sarah now, yeah. so that we can get to hear what Jason's got to say. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. I'm the Director of Arts and Creative Industries at the British Council in Singapore. Our work is based on the power of culture to bring people together, exchange knowledge and skills, and create understanding between the UK and Singapore with work that is underpinned by our core values of equality, diversity, and inclusion. It's now my great pleasure to present our speaker for today, Professor Jason Pomeroy. Jason is an award-winning architect, academic, and TV presenter. He holds a master's from the University of Cambridge, where he now lectures, and a PhD from the University of Westminster. Jason is an expert in sustainable design and the founding principal of the Singapore-based Pomeroy Studio and Pomeroy Academy, which comprise of designers and thought leaders in the sustainable built environments. Jason, we very much look forward to hearing from you. So handing over to you now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah, Your Excellency, Lissy, and to everybody on this call. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to a lecture on the balance being the new normal, the effects of COVID-19 on the future built environment thinking. Now, cities have been the product of our convergence since time memorial our yearly festivals, our monthly political rallies, our weekly religious sermons, and our daily com commercial transactions. We converge at various times and then we disperse. Now, cities have grown out of this element of convergence of economic prosperity, power, knowledge, and culture, and have attracted and seduced people to migrate to them. As Samuel Johnson said of his city, uh, if you're tired of life, okay. Thank you. So maybe somebody wants to put their microphone on mute. As London is, uh, if you're tired of life, not if you're tired of London, you're certainly tired of life. As populations grew and migratory patterns to urban centres continued, cities increasingly became theatres for our time-specific performances and interactions. The street and the square being the stage set for society's actors to converge. Such convergences and transactions between people and place, coupled with centuries of industrial, technological and digital advancement, have seen our urban habitats transform from being cities of spaces to cities of objects and now networks of digitalized cities that do not necessarily require one's physical presence to be able to converge. Now, oceans account for 70% of the surface area of the earth and deserts only 20% and cities account for a mere 
yet 70% of the global population will be living in city centres by 2050. We think nothing of migrating to cities in search of utopian dreams, despite their dystopian associations with crime, congestion, pollution, and the current heightened biological threat of infection. And I kind of say current because pandemics, as we have seen throughout history, have come and gone. If time was a metric scale, various pandemics have shown up as millimetres of disruption. So whilst those blips have helped shape socio-spatial and cultural and environmental considerations in our cities, we should be mindful that they have not stopped the march of inner city migration and growth. So I want to see what the effect of those pandemics have been on the built environment. Ultimately, I want to see the lessons that can be learned and how we should be shaping our cities of the future. But in order to do so, let's have a look at some of those global pandemics past and present. There have been pivotal moments in history that have helped shape both social and spatial practices. Let's take the 14th century bubonic plague as an example, a disease caused by the bacterium Yersia pestis that circulated among wild rodents living in greater numbers and density. Often regarded as the worst pandemic in history, it was transmitted to humans via rats through bites from infected rat fleas. It originated in China and gradually swept across Europe, killing nearly 25 million people, which accounted for almost 40% of Europe's population. Crowded human settlements acted as a catalyst in the transmission of the plague. This motivated fundamental urban improvements during the Renaissance that included the clearing of overcrowded living quarters, opening up of large public squares and the development of quarantine facilities. In Venice, public stricken Venetians and uh, docking ships were isolated in islands such as Lazaretto Vecchio and Lazaretto Nuova. The English term quarantine originates from the Italian term for 40 day isolation period. Now let's turn to the 19th century and in particular cholera. Cholera is an acute infection caused by the bacterium Vibrio cholera. People contracted this infectious disease after ingestion of food or water that was contaminated with the bacteria and could lead to dehydration, septic shock and even death in a few hours. The first cholera pandemic emerged in Jessore in India and claimed one million lives around the world. Rapid modernization propelled the spread of the disease along trade routes, arriving in developed industrial towns in Europe, where its spread was aided by crowded housing conditions and unhygienic water sources. It influenced the great sanitary awakening, which led to infrastructural initiatives such as the installation of underground water systems. London responded to the outbreak through a modern sewer system followed by the landscaping of the River Thames, muddy shorelines, and ultimately a public awareness campaign relating to the drinking from public wells. What about the 20th century Spanish influenza? The Spanish influenza is a highly contagious flu caused by the H1N1 virus, where it attacks the respiratory system and can lead to pneumonia. It transmitted from person to person via airborne respiratory secretions. The origin of the flu was believed to be in Spain, but it has been recently debated that it could have actually been earlier in US naval personnel cases in the spring of 1980, actually in America. It eventually spread rapidly, claiming 50 million lives worldwide. The spread of the pandemic has often been attributed to crowded neighborhoods and poor nutrition and sanitation. Now, this meant that cities responded to the pandemic through public awareness campaigns and community quarantine measures that included the lockdown of public places. In New York, they had a ban the cup campaign aimed at doing away with community cups used for water consumption from public fountains. The pandemic also helped shape new housing policies aimed at improving housing conditions. So into the 21st century, and let's have a look at SARS. SARS, 
severe acute respiratory syndrome is an airborne virus identified in 2003, which commonly resulted in the development of highly contagious and potentially life-threatening form of pneumonia. It originated in the Guangdong province in China and later spread to several countries in Asia and beyond. It resulted in over 8,000 cases and 800 deaths globally. The outbreak of SARS raised concerns regarding health and hygiene issues, as many believed that the spread of the pandemic was aided by compact and crowded housing settlements. It emerged as a public health problem, which tested the adequacy of public health infrastructure in cities. The installation of thermal cameras alongside community isolation measures aided the monitoring of quarantine individuals. Hong Kong responded to the pandemic by promoting better ventilation of spaces in communities as a guiding factor of future public housing policies. And now we can look at COVID-19. COVID-19 is an infectious respiratory disease transmitted by viral particles that can be directly deposited on surfaces or suspended due to natural or mechanical airflow patterns or other sources of turbulence in the environment. It is believed to have originated in Wuhan, China, and has thus far led to 22 million cases and over 700,000 deaths worldwide, making it one of the world's most deadly pandemics. This has led to the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression and transformed our working, learning, playing and living regimes. Countries such as Singapore have responded to the pandemic through fiscal measures to support the economy, while also executing a nationwide circuit breaker period, followed by digitally advanced contact tracing measures to successfully monitor and limit cases in the community. Whilst these tragic events show up as blips on the city's evolutionary scale, they have left an indelible mark on our cities. Quarantining, social distancing, face masks, public facility lockdowns and screening have thus far been the primary means of combating the pandemic and arguably echoes the very social, cultural and political mechanisms that were historically used with prior pandemics. COVID has challenged our basic human needs for convergence, physical interaction and social co-presence. It has forced us to recalibrate our use of space in cities, buildings and landscapes, and to use technology as a means to converge at in a safe and virtual manner. So, remote working, e-learning, online shopping and digital cultural offerings from the comfort of your sofa negate the need to be physically out in public and are just some of the methods that we are seeing shape our new lives. So what are the effects on the places we inhabit? Let's start with the workplace. Changes in the workplace that reflected our shift from a manufacturing to digital based economy, as well as the occupancy, density and productivity conundrum started way before the pandemic. The workplace was increasingly being perceived as either a fluid campus of collaboration, a highly tuned box of spatial efficiency or a repurposed space with good coffee and Wi-Fi. All are united by a belief that being smart can deliver better productivity and enhance revenue of the corporation, group or individual. But with the pandemic, a further factor united these models, and that was the increasingly prophylactic and sanitised experience of the workplace. Thermometers, hand sanitizers, QR codes and masks serve as a further line of defence before we arrive at our workstations. Despite the sanitised experience, the office lures us back as an employee's comfort blanket of normality and an employer's psychological crutch of productivity. So what can we expect from the new office? Well, maybe more space temporarily. Companies wanting employees to return to the office will have to reduce capacity in each floor by between 30 to 50 percent, given social distancing measures. This has led to concepts such as what you see here in the six foot office. The concept resembles a series of socially distancing circles that are etched into the floor as a conscientious effort of personal space awareness. The workplace, which increasingly proffered the benefits of space to aid the health, well-being and productivity of the individual, 
will serve as a beacon for convergence to collaborate. After all, we are still creatures that need social interaction and the workplace will reassert itself as a place of meeting, especially as the home will continue to be an extension of the workplace. So this brings us to the consequences of accepting the very existence of the home office and its relationship to the workplace. Turn of the 20th century workplaces resembled factories of office workers patrolled by the office manager with the view that presence meant productivity. The, effort, the essence of surveillance as a tool to coax the worker had largely remained unchallenged until the pandemic predicament made us homebound and arguably we can still switch on those webcams. Working from home has become part of our digitally enabled future, suiting some roles and personality types more than others. WFH negates the need to travel and can allow for a greater flexibility in one's lifestyle to be more productive. There is no value in commuting to make back-to-back -back calls all day, which could be done from the comfort of your home. Depending on your role, we should be able to choose when to go in and accordingly what we need to do relating to when to go in. With work from home, the workplace vibe may have also changed and runs the risk of becoming polarised between those who are in the office and those who are out. And the psychological effects can potentially be damaging. It is thus essential for us to carefully recalibrate the workplace, not just in terms of space, but also the psychological well-being of the employee. Those with childcare needs, who is a primary caregiver or who has a disability may less likely return to the office and should not be excluded from the conversations before the pandemic started or disadvantaged through their lack of physical presence in the office. This necessitates a culture of trust from the employer and the eradication of the presence means productivity mentality. By using technology as a means of close or virtual connection, out of sight need not mean out of mind. So let's turn to a place to learn. During this time of lockdown, we have witnessed a remarkable disruption in education that had typically been delivered through traditional teaching environments. In universities around the world, classrooms, dormitories and auditoria have, up until now, largely been unaltered. They exist as multifunctional communities in themselves and as such would not be incomprehensible to a 19th century professor teleported into the 21st century to make such an inspection. As many of those educational environments gathered dust, some 1.2 billion global students have retreated to virtual classrooms and lecture theatres from the comfort of their home. For many students and academics, the return to campus life and its cultural practices, opportunities for knowledge transference and the broadening of one's networks will collectively form multiple points of convergence that a Zoom call cannot provide. But like the workplace, these experiences will similarly need to be tempered. In addition to a more sanitised, de-densified environment, effective containment methods that include regular testing, contact tracing and ample quarantine space should be in place to sustain, to sustain the well-being of those on campus. Like the workplace, social distancing measures will prevail from classrooms to auditoria to dorms as a means of reducing pupil density. Desks facing in the same direction will reduce transmission from virus containing droplets, but I do question those opportunities to socially engage together in group collaborative efforts and, and team, work team workshops. Lecture theatres will see con seating configurations reduced to 25% of original capacity. And student dormitories are being reconfigured from quads to twins and even single rooms. Finally, universities are setting aside space for quarantine, which will reduce the amount of available on-campus housing, regardless of capacity. But the biggest contribution to the reduction of pupil density comes in the form of 100% online or even blended learning. Even before the pandemic, many universities were embracing a blend of institution-based and home-based learning, and a curricula conceived as a kit of parts delivered in a far more time-flexible manner. 
having a combination of online and in-person teaching can reduce the costs of running a full capacity education campus and can make the education arena more economically accessible for all. According to a World Bank report from 2010, only one in 20 people have completed tertiary level education. By being able to stay at home, there is a heightened flexibility for those students wishing to continue being gainfully employed. This makes education potentially more affordable and equitable. For, pros for your prospective students, the benefits go beyond accessibility and affordability. Uh, blended learning in the future may become a necessity. Average life expectancy has increased from 65 30 years ago to about 72 years today. Arguably, the lifelong job and token gold watch upon retirement is becoming an obsolete model, and there is the increasing prospect of people having more than one career in their lifetime. This would warrant further education. We will see more enrolments in online programmes, often driven by adult learners looking to wait out the recession and using their time productively by upskilling. It would therefore seem imperative that lifelong learning allows everyone to stay relevant and resilient. So what about a place to play? After you've had a long day in the office or you've been studying hard, where do you go to relax? What will be the complexion of those places that we will have grown accustomed to over time, but what are they like post-COVID? And will hospitality, whose etymology evolved from the Latin root hospice, take a sanitised cue from its healthcare cousin. Regardless of whether a hotel, theatre or restaurant, will my drop-off experience include biohazard screening, access via QR code? Will my room, seat or table have an air of the clinical after being cleansed using multiple antiviral agents? And will my dining experience turn into a claustrophobic a la carte affair of perspex screens and e-menus? Well, I guess the answer so far is yes to all. But the challenge will be to see how the hermetically sealed, artificially lit and ventilated theatres, galleries and museums can embrace a greater openness to natural light and natural ventilation for the environmental and social benefits for all. Perhaps we should say goodbye to confined petri dishes of disease and hello to porous, inclusive cultural clusters that promote knowledge and well-being for all. As we now return to the comfort of those reopened cafes and restaurants and galleries and museums, and sorry for those who haven't had the chance yet, the circles of exclusion still remain and continue to challenge our acts of being appreciative of our hosts' hospitality. The marriage of de-densification with time conscientious schedules seeks to make best use of the current situation. However, of all the forms of entertainment, the sadness can be most felt in the theatre, many of which have been forced to open at 25% of original occupancy. The need for our audiences to feel the performers has resulted in organisations like the Society of London's Theatres to commission scientists at the University of Oxford to develop alternative protocols, such as people sitting with masks next to each other to maintain that theatre vibe. For those who can't get out and enjoy the great outdoors or the great spaces of the theatre, it probably comes as little surprise that our physical experience of culture and entertainment will increasingly be balanced by the virtual twin from the comfort of one's home. Our design and research works that were recently exhibited at the Mori Museum in Tokyo, as you can see here, was twinned with a virtual exhibition which allowed a broader audience to experience our work. There is no replacement for being physically present when circumstances permit, but we need to be conscious of technology's potential to decentralise activities for the greater benefit of society. This may sound like an Aristotelian cliche, but the greater interrelationship between the sum of hospitality, culture, entertainment and leisure parts can offer the prospect of more local, diverse choices for the public. Just as a Zoom call is no replacement for personal interaction, neither is a virtual cultural or entertainment experience a replacement for the real thing. Safety is important, yes 
but we should ensure that the pandemic does not swing the hospitality pendulum far from the values and meaning of the word hospice, the interrelationship between guest and host. The place to live. The space in which we live has always been the most universally understood and in the simplest terms provides a place of shelter, protection and rest from the extremities. Man's technological and cultural advances over time has shaped how we live, turning space into place and being a mirror to the culture and lifestyle of those within. As homes over the years have taken on further technological advances that reflect our shift into the digital age, they can similarly represent the complexity of our daily lives. Our ability to work from home and yet be connected to colleagues in a different time zone further decentralizes our need to be anchored to a particular place. The home therefore needs recalibration if it is not just a residence, but a place of multiple uses. Spending more time at home to work, to learn, to play, thus potentially increases the number of people in close proximity, necessitating greater consideration for the need for natural light and ventilation. Florence Nightingale's revolutionary hospital wards helped combat the spread of infectious disease by acknowledging that the exposure to outdoor air and sunlight played a critical role in diluting and dispersing infectious agents and greatly reducing the chance of their survival further. One only needs to look at the housing reforms that have taken place over the previous hundred years to correlate our health and well-being with the provision of what has always been a basic human need. The importance of natural light, of natural ventilation, and a connection to the outside for well-being cannot be underestimated. It's for this reason that winter gardens we designed in our recent housing project in Sweden served as hermetically sealed warm rooms in the winter, but could be converted into verandas in the summer. This allowed residents to connect with the great outdoors as a series of spaces for exercise, rest and recuperation. Treating terraces as additional outdoor rooms can provide an element of self-sustenance when edible plants are incorporated or can be densely foliated for their environmental attributes of absorbing noxious pollutants and reducing temperature. This pandemic has made it painfully obvious also that people living in high density environments, such as slums and migrant dormitories, are more prone to contracting and spreading the virus, given proximity and the sharing of facilities. Density is often an effective urban service solution, whereby running water, power, communication infrastructure can be provided efficiently to entire communities by their consolidation. Yet many people lack access to essential services such as these, and thus has challenged our responses to COVID-19 in many cities. Access to services that we may take for granted makes lockdown orders even almost impossible to comply with in some places. Thus, closing the urban services divide must be a priority for cities moving forward. The digital age that allows us to work, learn and play from the comfort of our increasingly spatially constrained homes has thus resulted in many capsule concepts. They seek to address spatial, economic and now viral pressures. Our various time sensitive activities that may have been dispersed through the course of the day within our chosen city can be now programmed into singular, flexible and adaptable spaces within. This further reduces the need for multiple rooms of multiple functions. When it comes to these micro solutions, our moment of social divergence is paradoxically having a moment of spatial convergence. And finally, the place to connect. For centuries, our streets and squares have allowed people to connect and generate a sense of belonging with the part of the city that they're in. Urbanity refers to the public life that it happens as a result of these exchanges that a city can enable. The combination of cultural diversity with a density driven through close proximity achieves that element of urbanity. This is why cities have densified for centuries to achieve culturally rich, socially diverse and economically prosperous places. 
But the pandemic has recently altered urban life and the recent advocacy for de-densification and, de -de and decentralization challenges the concept of urbanity. As the 19th century saw engineered channels of void spaces cut through our cities, they effectively provided modern urban sanitization systems for public health. But by the 20th century, we saw social spaces cut into buildings in the form of terraces, sky courts, sky gardens, to offer further environmental and mental health benefit. Our continued urbanization in the 21st century has seen such sky rise spaces increasingly scattered through our urban habitats to better accommodate the social needs of our urban populations, whilst helping to restore our ecosystems. They have joined the urban vocabulary of the street and square and when they're originally foliated, can act as environmental filters and sponges to noxious pollutants. During this time of crisis, we have felt the value of such spaces as being outdoors with natural light and ventilation is sometimes safer than being indoors. But such de-densification exercises has also extended to street level. During the lockdown, we witnessed less travel on public transportation and an increase in walking and cycling. Working or studying from home and the digital means to converge has negated the need to travel unless absolutely necessary. The reduced frequency of cars on our streets similarly reduces the pressure to expand our road infrastructure. This offers the prospect of cleaner, car-free streets that can emphasize active personal mobility and integrate with public transportation. This in turn helps reclaim congested streets for the people. And as we grow accustomed to the notion that we do not need to go to the office or campus on a daily basis, the ability to decentralize or effectively look at our developments in a more self-sustaining way has become the new normal. During the period of lockdown, we have felt the cascading economic effect of the crisis, which impacted supply and production chains and had a ripple effect on the national and global economy. The creation of more resilient, self-sustaining, yet connected communities will become a reality. Places like Higashi Matsushima, disaster responsive eco town, as you see here, can manage their own clean energy generation, food production, waste and water systems. And they should not only manage waves of further outbreak, but also be resilient to climate change related disaster too. When I think of climate change related disasters, it is not hard to disassociate this with flooding. Over the next 50 years, the population of Tokyo, New Orleans and Amsterdam will be surpassed by Kolkata, Mumbai and Tianjin, booming Asian coastal metropolitan areas where trillions of dollars of assets will be vulnerable to flooding. Densifying our cities by increasingly building skyward may have been the stock response in the 20th century, but our current population and urban density issues have been further compounded by the pandemic. This has yielded a re-evaluation of a surface area that accounts for two thirds of the earth, water. Iberg in the Netherlands, as you see here, is a great example of a decentralized sustainable development that occupies an underutilized dockyard to regenerate an area of Amsterdam whilst being resilient to rising sea levels. Now, over these slides, there are a number of commonalities that present themselves and allows us to look at them in further consideration. Disinfection, de-densification and decentralization in particular. These notions are supported by the use of physical and virtual space and an increase in the integration of technology to enhance people's lives. This may appear to work now, but how sustainable are they in the long term? Let's think about disinfect, increase rare rates and embrace of natural light and ventilation and the encouragement of more porous and, and certainly sanitized environments. This period of social and economic lockdown has seen a remarkable reset of our earth with cleaner waters, cleaner skies and cleaner air. But as industries crawl out of lockdown, we cannot afford to return to our carbon intensive ways. Our prophylactic and sanitized experiences have helped fight the viral pandemic. Yes, 
but the chemical and plastic intensive nature of copious takeaway cartons and face masks has led to a plastic pandemic. Our hermetically sealed, sanitized environments used to be balanced and need to be balanced with environments that are porous and can breathe. Buildings like our Alice building in, in Singapore should embrace the benefits of natural light and ventilation as a means of enhancing the health and well-being of the individual and help combat viral agents via particle dilution through larger volumes of air and UV light. Let's think about de-densifying and decreasing people per square meter, social distancing measures and optimizing space through more time-based structuring. We may think that de-densifying our places to work, learn, play or live is the answer, but it cannot be forever. Cost of real estate in city centres and their efficiencies to optimise return on investment have become so finely tuned that having lesser people in such places may make developments unaffordable. We should balance the short term need for less dense spaces and places with long term realities of population increase and continued inner city migration post pandemic meaning a phased return of people to city centres over time. We will need to recalibrate the street and give precedence to the pedestrian and cyclist over the automobile and thus reclaim streets for the people, not too dissimilar to what we're doing here in Singapore at the Kalang Alive Master Plan, an 89 hectare sports, recreation and leisure orientated place that would allow people to explore the great outdoors again. And whilst this period has seen the decline in the use of public transportation, given fears of infection spreading through enclosed proximity, we should not lose sight of how public transportation in the long term can maintain our drive towards a car light, cleaner, greener built environment. And finally, decentralizing, applying technology to augment social practices and allow for remote working, learning and playing and including alternative social spaces. We may think decentralizing is the natural step to avoid social convergence through the acceptance of working from home, e-learning, e-commerce, e-culture, e-entertainment. But this potentially undermines the gains made by creating compact, connected urban developments that have optimized public infrastructure and helped economic growth through our need to converge in physical space. We need to balance decentralizing our daily routine through technology with policies that maintain the importance of having dense urban centers that provide a means of convergence and co-presence. Decentralization may also come in the form of looking at alternative forms of urbanism and underutilized sites that are ripe for regeneration, like our explorations in waterborne communities, as you can see here. This could allow for new self-sustaining and resilient communities that reduce the stresses and strains on inner city life, but are still part of the city. So, if there is a silver lining, maybe the case of a more smart and sustainable built environment that requires a re-evaluation of the triple bottom line. In 1987, the Brundtland Report sought to address the concern about the accelerating deterioration of the human environment and natural resources and the consequences of that deterioration for economic and social development. It has been argued that if a development is to be truly sustainable, a balance between the needs of man and nature is required through the careful trade-offs between social, economic and environmental parameters of equal weighting, for which the academic Mark Mawinney coined the balance theory of sustainability. But in 2020, at the World Urban Forum, uh, we proposed culture as the fourth pillar of sustainability, our city spaces which may have once been imprinted by cultural practices and time-tested rituals are also being compromised through the process of urbanization, which potentially undermines the cultural identity of a place. If globalization represents modernity and modernity is the harbinger of identity, a cultural sustainability may be able to form a localized counterpoint to globalization. 
But as we head into 2021, I think there are two further pillars that ought to be considered that can help redefine sustainability once more, and that is inclusion of space and technology. Space continues to be depleted through urbanization, and in this time of pandemic has never been such an important commodity to preserve. One cannot have a discourse about society and the way people interact without also discussing the space in which we can do it. Spatial sustainability as a counterpoint to social sustainability seem inseparable and key to the success of our future urban habitats. Society continued use of technology means many innovations have now become ubiquitous in our daily lives, and we need to ensure that the use of technology is in itself sustainable that it offers the ability to converge, not just during pandemic-stricken times, but can enhance our daily lives. So allow me to leave you with six pillars for our post-COVID world, and hopefully with some hope. The pandemic will not stop our need for co-presence. We will need to learn to balance periods of stepping out to the great outdoors with the need to periodically step back in in a more responsible manner. The pandemic will not stop our need to express ourselves through the arts. We need to balance how we converge in decentralized local cultural arenas with more global virtual cultural experiences. Dedensification strategies should be feasible according to the circumstances, balanced with decentralization strategies that look at alternative opportunities for urban regeneration. The hermetically sealed box needs to be balanced, if not challenged, by more porous, naturally ventilated and lit spaces for the health and well-being of our natural and man-made environment. We should embrace new technology sparingly and balance with the knowledge that some of the best lessons in combating the pandemic are low-tech solutions that have stood the test of time. And the pandemic may have affected our economic growth near term, Though long term, we will need to learn to balance global connectivity with local self-sustenance if we are to be more resilient. We have witnessed how Oxford University, as an academic institution, has collaborated with AstraZeneca, a pharmaceutical corporation, to find a vaccine in record time. This has been made possible by fast-track processes of agile governance that ensure people in clinical trials can be tested for the greater well-being of humanity arguably a model that allows for the collaboration of academia, government, civil society and private corporation need not be reserved for the creation of a vaccine, but should similarly be a model for the creation of more resilient and sustainable built environments. Notions covered in my recent book, Cities of Opportunities, but I'll leave that for another occasion. There have been pandemics in the past and there will be more pandemics in the future. Thankfully, we, like our built environments, are remarkably adaptable and resilient, and it is with hope that they will continue to be so for the benefit of our future generations. I would like to thank uh, everybody here, the British Council, the British High Commission, and to all of you who have taken time from your busy schedules to join me today. Thank you, stay safe, and keep the faith. Thank you, Jason. That was really, really insightful, and I'm sure it's left uh, a lot for us to think about. Um, everyone, we have about seven minutes left before we end. Um, so I think we um, a lot of questions haven't come through on the chat, but we had questions which our participants had submitted uh, when they had registered for the for the lecture. So Jason, I would I would like to put a few of them to you in the time that we have, um, and then I will invite uh, our country director, Miss Lucy Watkins, to close the session. But first, let's let's do a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, there was a question which asked, um, how do the architecture of homes change with the heightened awareness of proper hand hygiene when returning home. Uh, for example, would, would we be designing homes now with a washing area near the entrance of the home? Well, it just reminds me of all of those converted terrace houses where you have, you know, the flight of stairs and that sort of little nook or cranny underneath that would allow you to be converting it into a washroom. But I think that there has been this almost innate programming within us to almost naturally come in, take your shoes off and, you know, wash your hands. And I guess 
it, it comes down to kind of personal social practice. When it comes to the shaping of the home, I think it's similarly based on the social practices that shape the physical places. I think that when people sort of think of architecture coming first and then somehow uh, the people slotting into the architecture, um, that's not necessarily the appropriate way of going about it. Ultimately, it's the social practices that actually inform the way that we would want to live, work or play. So ultimately, some of those practices that we have um, almost started to take for granted now, where we might be preparing ourselves to move inside, you know, take off the jacket, wash the hands. This will be programmed into our kind of spaces in the future. And I think that would be a good thing in terms of kind of our own personal hygiene. Thank you, Jason. There's another very interesting one. Um, do you think outdoor schools would have a future? Oh, wow, yes. And it just reminds me of the, you know, the years ago I did a TV series called City Time Traveller and I went to this school called the Panyaden School in, I think it was in, in Chiang, Chiang Mai, if I'm not mistaken. And um, what I found fascinating is that there were these beautiful outdoor classrooms that were constructed out of um, low walls of adobe and, 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 ba and bamboo roof. So a real element of design with nature. I guess it comes down to the climate that you're in. And if there is the prospect of, you know, a form that matches the climate and the ability to, in the tropics, teach on the outside, as we see in the Panyadem School in Chiang Mai or the Balinese Green School, then why not? I think I'd just get a bit worried if it was in Sweden, if, if I was to be perfectly honest. That might be a bit too cold for me. Thank you, Jason. Um, could I could I just uh, take the time to ask another question as well? Um, this is a larger, broader one. Who are the most important stakeholders in an ecosystem that naturally inclines towards buildings that are functional, healthy, and aesthetically pleasant? Oh, I thought I covered that in my last slide, but I, I think I'll, I'll I'll say it again. I mean, I don't I don't think it's the will of one individual, and I don't think it's. Um, uh, I mean, once upon a time, it was very much about the interrelationship between civil society and state. I mean, you look at some of the great places in the world like Siena in, in Italy or arguably <laughs> London as well. And the ability to have civil society kind of effectively forming a brief and states to be able to ratify the brief is, uh, is a starting point. And I think there's a wonderful book uh, written by Peter G. Rowe called... Um, I think it was called civic realism that I think wonderfully summarizes those two spheres of influence. However, I do think it's gone further than that now. I think that there are four spheres of influence. You've got civil society, which is effectively setting the brief, uh, people saying what they want out of their places to live, work, play and learn. You then have state to be able to ratify, but the ability to engage with academia, to test new ideas and also private corporations who are willing to invest in R&D to be able to make those spaces better and, and enhance our lives, our, our daily lives. I think those four spheres of influence are the key stakeholders to actually make more sustainable places. Thank you, Jason. We'll just take one last one uh, before we, we close the session. Uh, there was a question that is posted on the chat by Michael, and he wanted to ask if uh, you could comment on the current trends in energy efficiency technologies now that the demand for commercial building innovation has dropped drastically as more people are working from home? Well, I mean, I think that it's a snapshot in time and what we have seen is, you know, cleaner skies, uh, cleaner uh, waterways. We've, we've seen kind of lots of noxious pollutants being taken off the street and ultimately we'll want to try and ensure that that sort of is maintained. What I'll be very keen to see is how we can be shifting from the 86 million barrels of oil that are consumed on a daily basis, which is equivalent to filling five pyramids of Giza, to be maintaining our kind of more lower kind of carbon footprint ways that we've kind of experienced with kind of the halting of uh, a lot of uh, broader infrastructure. So I think it's about, again, getting to that balance. Um, we do want to still accept the importance of public transportation as a means of taking those noxious pollutants 
uh, off the streets and balancing those with kind of uh, clean technologies and renewable energy sources that can actually help uh, reduce our overall, overall carbon footprints and our reliance on, on fossil fuels. And when I look at places like Amsterdam, where they've had some remarkable kind of uh, policies to try and ensure that there is greater uh, use of public transportation and the use of clean energy to support um, the use of, of public transportation. I think that's a very good thing. That's what we should be aiming for. Thank you, Jason. I'm afraid, everyone, that's all the time that we have for. Um, I'd like to invite um, Ms. Lucy Watkins, Country Director of British Council Singapore, to say a few words in closing now. Lucy? Thank you, Lucy. Um, and on behalf of the British Council, thank you, Professor Pomeroy, for a very stimulating and thought-provoking lecture. Our High Commissioner was absolutely right when she predicted that the, the insights that you shared with us today would be very engaging and highly relevant to, to our time. So thank you very much. Um, and many thanks to everybody who's joined us today. I'm sure that you'll all be leaving this session with lots of ideas brewing in your minds about how cities may evolve into um, more sustain, sustainable spaces over time and also with a sense of hope, as suggested by Professor Pomeroy. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us and being part of this Knowledge is Great lecture. We're looking forward to inviting you back again to more of these lectures and hopefully in the not, not too distant future, we might be able to resume our in-person lectures as well. And just a final reminder that if you, if you still have any urgent questions that you'd like to ask Professor Pomeroy, Pomeroy then please do feel free to remain on the call for a few more minutes. As Lissy said, we'll keep the call open for 10 to 15 minutes so that you can um, ask any questions that you have. Um, and then for me, all, I, all that I, I need now to say is to wish you all a very good day, a very good evening, wherever you, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Hi, can I ask a question? Hi. Hi, hi. Um, how, how can we include, let's say, the disadvantage or, or, or the uh, the uh, the poor in, in the design of our of our cities so that they can be taken care of uh, instead of like uh, perhaps you know you have got um, unclaims and you know in the past and and, and where you know where the, the poor lives and then and, and rich somewhere else versus and, and now how can we make a different society through architecture? That's a lovely question. Who, who was that? Can you just say your name? And uh, that was a very good question. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Kim Ong, uh, Singapore. And um, well, I run social enterprises and and uh, it comes from, uh, the question comes from there. Lovely, lovely. Well, thank you very, very much for that question. I mean, um, what we have seen throughout history, um, and in particular, let's just take, for instance, the 19th century, with those huge slum clearance programs, which tried to bring sort of uh, greater public sanitation to you know, a greater mass of people, running water, electricity. I mean, ultimately, what I find remarkable is that whilst we kind of currently think that electricity and running water is kind of the norm, in so many places, it isn't. It's still something that is um, not necessarily a given. It's something that is really still quite sought after. Years ago, I was filming in a place um, in India where we were talking about smart cities. And what was remarkable is that we have the politicians who are basically saying, well, with the hundred smart city movement, we're going to have all of these smart cities and it's all about big technology effectively fostering new economies. And uh, their view of a smart city was all about the tech and all about the economy. And then when we went to the people uh, in the informal settlements, we said, well, what is a smart city? And they basically said, well, of course, it's running water, sanitation, electricity. And ultimately, I think it's about trying to bridge the divide there. Uh, I think that we have somehow lost our way. There are still needs for governments to try and ensure that we can get support. Um, and it's again back to those, those four, four spheres of influence, civil society, state, 
private corporation and academia working collectively together to ensure that running water, electricity and sanitation is there for the good of all. And I do think that, yeah, we cannot possibly be creating these new um, social housing schemes that are just pushed to the peripheries of cities. There does need to be a far greater integration. And arguably, when you think about the, the MRT system in Singapore, and arguably the London Underground system uh, in, in London. These were wonderful ways of actually connecting um, suburban places with the city centre. And I think that it is all about the infrastructure. As long as the infrastructure is in place to give you good mobility, sanitation, electricity, water, and obviously nowadays IT as well. These are some of the ways that we can start unlocking the value for those who do not necessarily have the chance that sometimes we can just take for granted. So I hope that uh, answers your question, Kim. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. Are there any other questions? How much knowledge do we have in terms of the management of water? Because, I mean, even in Singapore, I think there are more roads than cars. The number of uh, land for the roads is much more than the land for the trees. And then we push the bicycles off because we need big roads. So the bicycles have to share the space with the cars. Mm. I mean, in the end, you get a very hot country. Thank you for the question. And when I think about uh, what you're mentioning, there are several points there. There's one relating to cars, streets, also greenery. Um, one, one successful model that I would say, other than Singapore, because I think Singapore's embrace of urban greenery as a means of reducing ambient temperatures, absorbing noxious pollutants, as well as the embrace of public transportation and quite an effective MRT system, and ultimately various policies to try and take uh, cars off the street. The other example would be Barcelona. And I would say that the ability to try and ensure that you are looking at reducing the road networks, but are trying to give the street back to the people and start planting more lush green environments that are basically a combination of turf, shrubs, trees that can then help cool the environment for the people is actually a good thing. The question then is about how to irrigate these spaces. And naturally, that has to be done on a case by case basis. We've recently just done a project in Saudi Arabia where obviously water is a shortage and it's incredibly hot. So it's about using those particular species that are acceptable and also looking at some of the technologies from the past. For instance, small rocks that can be applied to rooftops that capture volumes of air that can then be used as a cooling blanket, which then helps cool the floor below and hopefully reduce the reliance on the air conditioning. I completely agree with you, what you're saying about the uh, the reliance on air conditioning. And I think that the embrace of natural light and natural, natural ventilation where we can is going to help us try and lead a, live a sort of a, a greener lifestyle. So, um, so thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Ailing. Um, Jason, there was another question on the chat that I just wanted to raise with you. This was something that was posed by Darren, and he was asking about existing built environments. Do you see the need to redevelop single use buildings such as office towers into multi use buildings, which it, which can incorporate open spaces and um, go into home living and co working and, and um, I, Such I, well, Darren asked a fantastic question, and I think there is this natural reserve uh, and, and fear that um, we are going to be seeing a lot of open spaces. And I recently wrote an article called, you know, the, the, you know, the office is dead, long live the office. <laughs> basically kind of questioning whether really is the office dead? I mean, yeah, sure, people are working from home and we will see a reduced occupancy level at the moment, but will it be like that forever? I'm sorry to say I don't think so. I, I actually think it's about ensuring that there's a level of adaptability. And so in the near term, we might need to be finding alternative spaces. And if we are thinking that there is going to be a greater take up of people wanting to be staying at home, maybe 30 or 40 percent of the workforce, then that means that planning policies may need to be reconsidered as to some of those inner city sites. But I think it would be quite 
short termist, if we were to look at our cities at the moment and look at our, some of our empty offices or empty buildings and think, now it's time to actually make them mixed use and let's start filling them with other things because there is going to be a sense of return. However, I do think mixed use development is important for city centres. We want to try and have that element of convergence. And so I think that should be part and parcel of any city's aim if we're trying to create um, economically sustainable developments that are going to be helping spur growth. Thank you, Jason. Um, we, we've just come to the uh, 10 minutes past the hour time. So um, I think this will be a good time on this note to then end this call. Thank you very much again and everyone who stayed on for the longer time. Uh, we, we've recorded the session, so we'll be posting this later and sending this out to everyone. Thank you again, Jason. Have Thank a good you. evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, everybody have a good day.